First Peter chapter one, verse thirteen. First Peter chapter one and verse thirteen. So grateful for Aaron's prayer this morning. It's a prayer that we should all be praying in various moments in the darkness of this hour as a culture when the wickedness of this age is on full display. We have need of prayer. We also have need of the voice of the Lord. When earthly security is threatened, earthly institutions are insecure, we have need of the voice of the Lord. When there are human divisions, when competing passions contend for supremacy across every news outlet and across every social media platform, we have need of the voice of of the Lord. There is a voice that we need above all that has authority over all and his voice is inscribed for us in these words. So knowing that this is the voice that we need, let's read this together. Beginning in verse 13 of chapter 1. Therefore, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Lord, please bless the preaching of your word. I remember a a number of years ago leading a youth retreat and teens and their parents were up in the mountains of Arizona at a youth campsite, and there was a late-night game underway in a field, and one of the mothers lost her wedding ring during the game. It was discovered. Obviously, it's at night, and the chances of us finding it seemed extremely slim, Uh, but everyone was, as you can imagine, immediately recruited to begin help, uh, helping to search for this ring, and miraculously, it was found But every husband and wife can identify with the the pang of worry if that were to take place. Because a a wedding ring is more than just the value of the jewelry. It's it's something that reveals the consecration of marriage. Actually, I've understood that in a a Jewish wedding ceremony, that's literally the word that they use. The groom says to the bride, behold, you are consecrated to me with this ring according to the laws of Moses and Israel. There's a, a consecrated nature to marriage symbolized by a, a precious ring. It's, it's consecrated. It's sacred. It's valuable. It, it indicates that there is a setting apart, a belonging to, a being a part of someone else in an absolutely comprehensive kind of way. A unique sacredness is symbolized by the preciousness of that ring. And Peter is trying to communicate to his readers and to us through the ages that we have been consecrated to the one who called us, that God has placed on us his calling, and therefore our lives should be consecrated to him in an even more grand way, but a way that that marriage can somewhat reflect. There is this, this categorical, this absolute consecration And since he's been talking in the first 12 verses of this passage about God's calling to us, the inheritance that he's given to the saints, the glory of his grace poured out on us who believe in Jesus, he now turns the corner and says, because of that calling, 
you must consecrate your life to Him. Because God has called you, He has called you to Himself and for Himself, and He has bestowed on you the grace that is beyond our comprehension. Therefore, our lives must be consecrated to Him. I like that word, consecrated. It's, it goes beyond dedicated and devoted. Other words I worked with this week, trying to get this message together. But I like that word, consecrated. It has a, a sacredness to it, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's not just devotion the way like an athlete would for the Olympics. It's a, it's a holiness. It's a holy setting apart unto. That's what Peter's getting at. He's saying the people who have received this inheritance must consecrate their lives to the Lord. They are consecrated to God. And there's two marks of this consecration that Peter walks through in this passage. Our hope and our holiness. But before he gets to those two marks, he inserts this very important word, therefore. You see down there in your Bibles, verse 13 begins, therefore, preparing your mind for action. Therefore, it's crucial to remember that this word is used in the New Testament to point people back to what the author has already described. It's used that way in English as well. Therefore, in light of what we've heard, it's important to remember what it is that we heard. He is reminding us that God, verse 3, caused us to be born again to a living hope. He's reminding them that we have an inheritance that cannot perish or fade, and that God guards His people to the very end, securing for them the moment when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's reminding them that this salvation has been anticipated through the generations of believers, but now has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and the coming of Christ. And He's saying, in in light of this majestic an unfathomable inheritance, therefore, therefore, so the full weight, the full freight, we could say, of the inheritance of grace, the salvation of mercy, the promises of eternal life come behind this next command. And that's true throughout the New Testament Scriptures. We are, we're never commanded to do things for moralism's sake alone, just to create good citizens or to be nice Christian people. No, those commands are, are freighted with, are driven behind this incredible motivation of the grace and character and promises of God. Close to my house, there is a, a train track, and I, I don't know if train tracks have different ratings where heavier trains go on heavier tracks or something, but, but the one that's close to my house, it, it must carry some serious loads, uh, serious loads, because you can tell, because in the middle of the night, it's, it's not real close to my house, it's across a major street and kind of number of houses and so forth, but when some of those loads come through, you can feel, I mean, the house shakes, you can feel it. I remember when I first moved into my home and it was the middle of the night, I woke up and I'm like, the wall is quivering. And that doesn't seem good. It was just the train. It was just the sheer weight of that train driving down those tracks and the overwhelming tonnage that was being propelled. Well, that's what's freighted into these words, therefore. Paul does the same thing in Romans chapter 12 where he says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. These therefore words we must not skip over and they should freight into our everyday lives. Therefore, consecrate your life to the Lord. Therefore, in light of God's grace, in light of God's mercy, in light of God's inheritance, in light of His incredible generosity, therefore, your life is consecrated to Him. It's not to be lost in a field, tossed aside. The marks of it should not be something indifferent to us. They should cause the gripping of our heart to ensure, are we preserving? Are we protecting? There should be a a freighting behind this consecration of the incredible grace of God. Therefore, he says, therefore, consecrate your life. Two marks of this consecration are hope 
and our holiness. Let's turn to them now. He says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, and here's the main verb, the imperative, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He begins by describing how we are to set our hope. We're to set our hope by means of an active mind and a sober heart. An active mind, the imager here is one who is, who is preparing themselves for a race or a battle, you might say. They are not encumbered by their long robes, and mentally that's to be the case for the Christian. This is, this is not a, a passive complacency or worldly optimism kind of hope. We could distinguish it from someone who is a glass half full kind of person who looks out in the future and says it's all right because Jesus will make everything turn out all right in the end and goes back to sipping lemonade on an inner tube. No, that is not the description of the Christian. The lazy river at the water park inner tube ride is not the Christian life. It is much more like those incredible images of the soldiers on D-Day preparing for the launching of their landing craft, quivering with anticipation. That is the life of the Christian. That's the kind of hope a Christian is meant to exercise. It's an active mind sobriety of heart, not intoxicated with the indulgences of this world, but, but active, prepared, vigilant. That kind of hope is what consecrates the life of the Christian. It's a consecrated hope. It's a vigilant hope, a diligent hope, a, a, a hope that is focused and prepared for the war zone, the spiritual war zone that is this world. Listen, if, if we think of the Christian hope as something that we confessed once at childhood and then drift through life reassured of, we are not lining up our thinking of the Christian life with the Bible. The Bible says we are in a war zone. We are in a spiritual war zone in which an enemy and our own flesh and the world are seeking to derail our hope and focus us on everything else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Peter's saying is, you need to prepare your mind for action. You need to be sober-minded in setting your hope on Jesus Christ. This is going to take a vigilance, a wartime hope. And then he says, where do you set your hope? We set it fully and completely, notice that word, fully, on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's reminding them again of that day when Jesus Christ will return and all that is wrapped up in that day that we even now experience by faith but then by sight. And he's saying the fullness of your hope should be placed on that day. The grace you will receive on that day should receive the full confidence of your hope. The full assurance of your hope should be placed securely on that day when Jesus Christ is revealed. And do we not have cause to set our hope fully on Christ? If 2020 has done nothing else, it has surely revealed how much cause we have to set our hope fully on the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in the midst of all the terrible things that this year has done, if we can speak that way, the, the good thing it surely has done is to cause God's people to ensure that they are setting their hope fully on the grace of the Lord Jesus and His return. That we are, are not those with one foot on the shore of Christ and another foot on the boat of this age, hoping that we can straddle the water and enjoy a bit of both. No, a Christian must have both feet firmly planted on the shore of Christ, that that is their hope, because this age, this age is a, a rowboat in rocky seas, and we need our feet securely on the solid rock of Christ. And so Peter's saying, set your hope fully fully on the grace given to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Full, full hope, complete hope, comprehensive hope, not a, a hedged hope that as we focus on the securities of this life, we have a backup plan called Christ. No, no, our full hope, our two-footed hope is placed on the grace of the Lord Jesus. We have no hope in the false securities of this age. In this age, we are vulnerable to sickness 
And in that day, death and disease will be no more. So we place our hope in that day. In this age, we are witnesses to injustice and ungodliness in government and lawlessness and racial division in culture. But in that day, the king of righteousness will reign from his throne. In this age, there is and there has been violence against the vulnerable, oppression against the weak. But in that day, the king of mercy, who lifts up the weak and protects the defenseless, will reign from his throne. So we, we set our hope on that day and not on this day. In this age, there is division and anger and bitterness and selfishness and idolatry and spiritual complacency. But in that age, the king will renew his creation and his people will be made perfectly in his image. So we, we set our hope on that day. We set our hope fully on the, resu- on, the, on the day when the Lord Jesus returns, on the grace given to us on that day. We don't set our hope there as a means of earning God's favor. We set our hope there because we believe by faith that God will give grace to his people on that day. Not because they've earned it, but because, by, because of his own mercy, he has poured out grace through Jesus Christ. And it'll be revealed on that day. Set your hope fully. Now, our experience of the darkness and brokenness of this age should motivate us all the more to set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we should be aware, since this is a command, it is possible to disobey this command, to not consecrate your hope exclusively to Jesus Christ. It's possible to disobey this command. Hope is not something uh, that can be merely passive. That's why you have to have an active mind and a sober heart in applying it to Christ. It's possible to disobey this command as glorious as that day will be. And as much as a, a Christian believes those things in their theology, functionally, it's possible, isn't it, to set our hope partially on Christ and partially on the floundering rowboat of this age. Our hope must not be in a paradise of this earth created by the moral progression of society, but in the return of the king and the gift of a new creation. Perhaps you've heard a phrase. I've heard it used more frequently in recent years than I ever remember. It goes something like, I can't believe this is still happening. Or that person or this person is behind the times. Or you should catch up to 2020. And usually the reference is to some idea that society is is morally progressing through the ages. is becoming more and more enlightened, more and more morally progressed. Listen, there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that at all. The, the world, non-Christians in this world, apart from belief in Christ, are not going to become more and more morally progressed. A- apart from belief in Jesus, it doesn't matter if you lived in the first century or the 20th, you are bound in the grip of sin. There's no moral progression. I think sometimes we deceive ourselves that because there is technical or <laughs> literary progression or civilized progression, that there is moral progression, that there is not. And Christians must not buy into that idea that society is morally progressing. No, it is, it is not. Apart from Christ, there is no moral progression. We must not set our hope in the moral progression of society rather than in the return of the Lord and the grace given to us on that day. We set our hope fully on the grace given to us in the Lord Jesus and and not in the moral progression of society. Our hope hope must be distinguished from the good godly work we can do in this day. There is good godly work for God's people to do in this day. There is even good work that those who do not believe in Jesus are enabled to do by his common grace. But that is not the same thing as the hope that we set exclusively on the Lord Jesus. 
We have to distinguish between godly work and godly hope. Now, they are both present in the Christian, but they must be distinguished. There are many things that we work for in this world that are not the location of our hope. Let me say that again. There are many good things that we work for in this world that are not the location of our hope. For example, we work to be just and to promote justice, but our hope is in the return of the righteous king. We work to be peaceful and to promote peace, but our hope is in the return of the prince of peace. We work to be unified and to promote unity, but our hope is in the head of all things who will be the center of the new heavens and the new earth. We work to unite races and to oppose any racial injustice, but our hope is in the day when Christ will unite every tribe and every nation. We work to be law-abiding citizens and to promote submission to lawful authority, but our hope is in the day when the glory of his gracious rule will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There are many good works that a Christian better be doing if they are a Christian and better be promoting if they are a Christian, but we must distinguish those good works done by Christians or non-Christians are not what we set our hope on. We set our hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is possible, Christians, to disobey this command as Christians and to have a less consecrated hope in the Lord Jesus. And just because it's hope doesn't mean it's not disobedience to not do it. We tend to think of hope as the cheerful commands, the happy commands, commands that are sort of easier to obey. It's not like self-control and those really hard ones. No, hope is like, oh, that's a piece of cake. Hope is hard when there are many other voices inviting you to hope in them. There's many pleasing voices calling out for the moral progression of society. And the Christian, if they are attuned to God's word, sees in those morals biblical values that they should affirm and should work for and should represent. But don't confuse godly work and godly hope in our work. We set our hope fully on the grace to be revealed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. If utter despair or utter ecstasy attaches to moral progression or regression in society, it's a signal that our hope has not been set fully on the Lord Jesus Christ. If utter despair or utter ecstasy happens when society progresses or regresses morally, it's a signal that our hope has not been set fully on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are those who lament the moral regressions of society, yet not without hope. We are those who rejoice in the progressions of society, yet not as our hope. Our hope is set fully on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to do this. We have to do this. We have to be vigilant on this, setting our minds for action on this. Listen, do not wander into social media or the news or the updates of this current time without an active mind guarding your hope. Don't do it because you will be derailed. Your hope will be derailed. You either be depressed or elated by something that should only encourage or discourage you. And have you noticed, have you noticed that even when this culture happens to be aligning with the scriptures on a particular moral issue, it does so in a fickle and fluctuating and selective way. And therefore, that's why it's dangerous to set your hope on the moral progression of society, because society is moral in a selective kind of way, isn't it? Therefore, we should not set our hope on the moral progression of society. Have you noticed that, even right now? Have you noticed that this culture denounces the murder of a grown man, which it should, but legalizes the murder of an unborn child? 
Christians should denounce both, unashamed and fearless. Have you noticed that the culture denounces racism, which it should, but promotes sexual promiscuity and vulgarity of every kind? Christians must denounce both, fearless and courageous. The culture denounces the abuse of power, which it should, but worships at the idol of celebrity gossip every day. Moral progression is something Christians should cheer, but not hope in. Moral regression is something Christians should denounce, whether it's denounced by culture or not. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you, not in moral superiority. It's not the, <laughs> it's not the earnings that will be brought to you. It's not the affirmation of your moral superiority that will be brought to you. It's the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There will never be a day where we are, <laughs> we are deserving of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We set our hope on the grace of God. We consecrate our hope. Consecrate your hope to the one who has called you. Consecrate it. Set it fully. Set it exclusively. Set it apart unto God and let no other drifting rowboat be the location of your hope. We have set our hope in the right place, actively and soberly, guarding it from the false hopes that call to us from inside and out every day, well, then, then we can progress to the next element of consecrating our holiness to the Lord. Listen, we, we cannot get this order wrong. We cannot get this order wrong. You, you cannot serve God without hope in Christ. You cannot. You cannot be holy without hope in Christ. If you try to be, you'll be a legalist or you'll give up in despair. You cannot be a Christian without hope in Christ, without hope fully on His grace. We have to get the order right. Hope in Christ must always precede our attempts to be holy. How many, how many people have come to church over their lifetimes and they've done their very best to be holy, but they've never had a hope in Christ? So we have to get the order right, and sometimes even godly Christians make that mistake functionally in their life. They, they focus on holiness, but they neglect hope, exclusive hope, in the grace of Christ, and they find that their drive towards holiness withers in the midst of their own struggle with sin. Hope in Christ first and foundationally, therefore in light of the grace of God, past and future, therefore consecrate your holiness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Consecrate your holiness. Our holiness, point number two. As obedient children, Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. He begins with this this declaration of us that is a role that we are to fulfill, obedient children. We are to be obedient children. Peter's not saying that you always are. He's saying that's what you should be. In light of the adoption of Jesus Christ, in light of the fact that God is your Father, which he'll repeat here in a few verses, God is your Father because of what Jesus has done, and you are called to be obedient children. This is your role. This is your designation. You are to be the obedient child. Now, everyone who's had a sibling or a child or a, a parent or were a child, which should cover everybody, um, you understand the difference between obedient and disobedient children. There's the obedient child. Yes, Daddy. Come here, son. Yes, Daddy. I'm coming. And there's the disobedient child. No, I don't want to. Is the obedient child, stop doing that, son. Yes, daddy. And the disobedient one, no, I want to. We had a situation recently where we had someone watching some of our children and, and one, one very, very little one. 
one very little one, was, was just decided that he didn't, he didn't want authority at that moment. And he seemed fairly casual about this decision. So we received a call. We were out, received a call. He, he, he won't do anything. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's cute when you're, you know, young and, and you know and you hope that gradually discipline will work its effect in a person's life. It's, it's not cute when you're a Christian grown and knowledgeable and say the same thing to God. It's a wedding ring intentionally tossed into a field. Peter says we're to be obedient children. He, he divides what that means into a negative and a positive calling. He says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That's the thing we're not to do. Do not, says the Father. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Before we knew the Lord, we were passionate, we were passionate about the things, the sinful idolatries of our heart in this age. It's referring to that time before God revealed himself to us. We were still living in the darkness of idolatry and sin. We were passionate for things other than the glory of God, for the cravings of sinful desires, for our own glory, for the pleasures of this age. We were passionate about the approval of man. We were passionate about indulging our sinfulness. And Peter says, do not conform to that pattern any longer. You've been reborn through the grace of God. You're to have a new family resemblance, and you are not to look like, in moral terms, what you used to look like. You should not bear that resemblance anymore. Being born anew through the grace of God and being given an inheritance in Christ does not mean you simply add religion to your old way of life. It does not mean you pursue your former passions and go to church on Sunday or occasionally read your Bible. It means you transition into an entirely new family resemblance. It means you must reject categorically reject the sinful passions of your former way of life and get them out of your life entirely. Do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance. Do not act out as if you do not know the God who has saved you. Do not act as if this world is your home. Do not act as if your glory is your primary goal. On the positive side, we're called to be holy in a reflection of God's holiness. As he who called you is holy, Peter says, you also be holy in all your conduct. And then he quotes, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. He's looking back to the, the pattern of the Old Testament scriptures and he's declaring, look, God's people were set apart to him, not just to receive his blessings, to, but, but to reflect his character. They were to be holy as he is holy. They were to bear the family resemblance of moral purity and separateness from the sins of this age. They were to look like God in moral purity and uprightness and righteousness. They were not to look like their former rebellious self. They were to look like the, the holiness that describes God in moral purity and uprightness. To be consecrated to God is not just to be an improved person. It is more than simply having a, a more respectable life. Listen, Listen, we desperately need this in the Bible Belt South. It is more than just having a more respectable life. I, I fear for the false assurance present in the thinking of the Bible Belt South that it is not biblical. It is much more than having a respectable social life. It is being holy as God is. 
if being a Christian seems possible and doable in your own culture strength, then you don't understand what being a Christian means. It is to be holy as God is holy. It doesn't mean to be God. It means to be as like God as a human can be. To bear the striking, the, 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 the striking resemblance of God. So do we? Do we bear a striking resemblance to the holiness of God? Of God, and there is a need. Brothers and sisters, there is a need for the holiness of the church in this age to bear witness to the holiness of God. There is a need for Christians who aren't just adding Christian religion to their former pattern of life, but are rejecting those former passions and resembling the holiness of God. C- can't we see the need for that in this age? Can't we see the need for that in our own hearts? The need to reject this idea of simply adding on Jesus to a former way of life rather than reflecting Jesus in our lifestyle? Don't we see the need for a church that is described by holiness of life, righteousness of conduct, that is God-like in their interactions and in their inner man? Be Holy, God says, as I am holy, not just holier than the neighbor or the Facebook friend. Holy as I am holy. And God does not command what he does not provide. And so there is the power of the Holy Spirit available to Christians to increasingly and in greater and greater measure be holy as God is holy. It doesn't matter if you're 8 years old or 18 or 80. You can be more holy as God is holy tomorrow than you were today consecrated to the Lord. There must be a people on earth no longer passionate about pride or their own position, but instead showing a holy reverence for the image of God because they revere God himself. There must be a people on earth no longer passionate about materialism, but instead showing a holy joy in the glory of God. There must be a people on earth no longer indulging every craving of the flesh, but showing a holy satisfaction in God himself. Do we show the holiness of God? Let that sink upon us, brothers and sisters. Let that sink upon our hearts. Don't you see in your life evidence even this week of conforming to the passions of your former way of life, acting as if you did not know God, acting as if you were not purchased by the blood of Christ and saved and headed towards Zion. Don't you see patterns in your own life, and I see them in mine, of neglecting being holy as God is holy. And how easy is it in this age of self-righteous outrage to be more outraged by the outrages of the culture than offended by the sinfulness of our own heart? How easy to be distracted from conviction by condemnation? How easy to point fingers out at the world and the lawlessness of society and the sinfulness of this age and neglect the conviction that God would bring to our own heart about how we can be more holy as he is holy. Listen, the church will do nothing for this age if it is more self-righteous than convicted of its own sin. Unless we think this is talking about some kind of physical separation. Let's remember that Jesus is for us the perfect example of what the holiness of God looks like in a human being. Among sinners, yet without sin. Among lusters, yet without lust. Among idolaters, yet worshiping God alone. Among the lost, yet living in constant prayer. Unstained by sin, yet yearning for the salvation of sinners. We are called to be consecrated, set apart as holy to the Lord. Rooting out every sin and defilement and showcasing the glory of God in all that we do. Listen. 
Listen, a holy church, a holy church has the opportunity to preach Christ to an unholy culture. An unholy church has little ground to proclaim a holy Christ. A holy church that is steeped in the language of self-righteous outrage cannot easily represent the God of absolute authority. A holy church that indulges in the same passions of the world cannot easily point to a God coming from a new world. Now, this world is quite literally burning in various places right now. There is sin everywhere. And there always has been. But for whatever reason, in the providence of God, and the machinations of the enemy, the sin has become socially uncomfortable at the present. It isn't that we've become more sinful in 2020. It's just that for whatever reason, in his providence, God has allowed those sins to disrupt the normal sleepwalking mode of society. And in that, the church has an opportunity. The church has a calling. We are those who do not boast of our appearance or our race as if we are superior to another. We are those who love to lift up the weak, who can denounce, can denounce injustice with a heavy dose of our own humility and our own deserving of God's wrath. Do you see the distinction? This world is able to denounce injustice with pride. It is not able to denounce injustice with humility. And what a difference that would make. Only those who are conforming to the holiness of God recognize in that holiness the very reason that they should be condemned and the overwhelming grace that God has displayed towards them. We are called to be consecrated to the Lord, holy to the Lord. Holy in every word we type. Holy in the manner in which we protest injustice in this world. Holy in the way in which we relate to those who disagree with us. Holy in the way we speak of ourselves in comparison to others. Holy in the way we relate to authority, even those we disagree with. Holy in the way that we are compassionate toward those who have suffered in ways that we cannot imagine. Holy in the rejection of self-righteousness and self-righteous indignation and self-confidence. It doesn't mean we have no personalities or opinions. It just means we hold them with a level of reverence for God himself. Be holy. It means that we live life conscious of reflecting the holiness of God. Men, is this your life, your hope, and your holiness consecrated to the Lord? Men, is this your life, hoping fully in the revelation of grace brought to us when the Lord Jesus returns, being holy as God is holy? Women, is this your life, your hope, and your holiness dedicated, consecrated to the Lord, guarded with a vigilance, refusing to let any other hope steal or deface that hope in the coming of the Lord Jesus, refusing to let any former passions defile that holiness that we must have as his children. Young people, is your life, your hope, and your holiness consecrated to the Lord? Listen, we are not occasional Christians. We are consecrated saints. And let's remember, let's remember the price paid for this consecration. We'll study this in depth next week. But Peter provides this substantial motivation for our lifestyle in verse 18. He says, this lifestyle is to come to us 
knowing that we were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Listen, listen, a husband consecrates to a wife, a wife to a husband, and there's a symbol of some kind of monetary value that's expressive of that. And, and Peter's trying to help them understand, look, you, you were ransomed from slavery and condemnation, not, not some earthly bauble or some jewelry or some ransom of gold. No, you, you were ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy One paid for your consecration. The Holy One paid for your calling. The Lamb of God suffered for for you to be holy. Listen, when we're thinking about guarding our hope, we need to guard it with the preciousness of knowing that Christ paid for this. Listen, a, a wife guards that ring, knowing what it cost that young man to save for it. Christians guard their hope and their holiness, knowing what it cost God to pay for us. You, Christian, make eye contact with your God right now. His voice, many voices, are there not right now? Shouting, screaming, <laughs> many voices. Let's, let this voice speak to you right now. Make eye contact with him in his word. You, Christian, you were ransomed by the blood of Christ. You were purchased. Your life, your life has been set apart by the blood of Christ. Your life has been consecrated by the blood of Christ. Your life has been called by the blood of Christ. This blood that purchased for you an eternal inheritance, a hope that cannot fade, the assurance of grace covering all of your sins, the confidence that you can approach God's throne without fear or trembling, and all purchased by the death of Christ for your latest sin and your first sin, for every worst transgression and that struggle that you've had your entire life. Listen, every one of those was laid on Christ and he paid the cost of them and consecrated your life to God by his final breath on the cross. You, Christian, you, you in that chair, you facing this burning world, you facing the struggles of this life, you suffering, you battling against the temptations and struggles of the flesh, you were ransomed by the blood of Christ and are consecrated to God by the death of his son. You must consecrate your life to God. You must be holy as he is holy. You you must honor the Lord and separate your hope totally onto him. You and me, we must consecrate the life that has been consecrated by the blood of Christ. Listen, this call must define this week. It must define this week. If it did not define last week, repent and come to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. How good to have a forgiving God. But it must define this week. It must define what we watch and what we say and what we harbor in our heart. It must define our interactions it must define our compassion for those suffering. It must define the end of self-righteousness in the presence of love and humility. It must shape our worship and the aroma of our homes. It must shape our marriages. It must shape our manner of working at work. It must shape our suffering. It must consecrate this week. Therefore, in light of the grace of God, Set your hope fully on that day of grace. Reject the patterns of your former passions and be holy since the blood of Christ has consecrated you to God.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you as the lamb who was slain for our sins. Lord, you paid for our anger. You paid for our pride and our laziness, our gluttony and our indulgence. Lord, you paid for it all. And you have ransomed us. And now, Lord, we are called to reflect you. Lord, so give us grace right now to repent of every way that we have lived an unconsecrated life and with fresh zeal to consecrate our life to you. Lord, in this unconsecrated world, may we be a consecrated people. In this unholy world, may we be a holy people. In this pluralistic, progressive world of morals that go up and down through the ages, may we be a steadfast people. Consecrate us, Holy Spirit. Receive our song, Lord, in Jesus' name.